every night, almost one billion people go to bed hungry. Global economic chaos and ongoing climate change is pushing that figure even higher. But in the last decade, thanks to the efforts of a group of courageous and determined people, the lives of those worst affected by starvation have been transformed. Hundreds and thousands of lives have been saved. Of all the continents, Africa carries the heaviest burden of hunger. And of all the people, African women bear by far the heaviest load. To most of us, this is wrong. But to some, it's simply unacceptable. I think for most of us who actually have never really been hungry for a sustained period of time, it, it, it can be hard to convey how awful this is as a daily reality. But it is the daily reality for maybe close to a billion people in the world. Everybody as a basic human right, has a right to food. It's almost as basic as life itself. All I know is that, that starvation is, is an obscene fact in the modern world. People should realize that people are starving unnecessarily. There's, there's enough food in the world. We can put probes on Mars. We can, <laughs> we can definitely treat hunger with basic food. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not rocket science. Over the past 20 years, Steve Collins, a medical doctor who specialises in nutrition, has worked in every major famine emergency in Africa. Nowadays, he works from a small farm on the southwest coast of the last European country to have experienced famine, Ireland. In 1998, Steve was awarded an MBE for his work in adult malnutrition. But it was when he teamed up with Concern Worldwide in 2000 that the way the world viewed and treated malnutrition was challenged and changed for good. They sought a new way to treat an old problem and they found it in the form of community-based therapeutic care, CTC, a remarkably simple yet revolutionary idea that restored the treatment of malnutrition to African mothers. <laughs> Until recently, these mothers and their babies would have been treated in centralised feeding centres. Traditionally, these centres were set up to administer famine relief to starving people and were considered the gold standard in treating malnutrition. To overturn this system, Steve Collins and Concern would have to take on the medical and aid establishment and prove that their approach was more effective. In 1996, Steve Collins went to Liberia to set up a traditional feeding centre. What followed was an outbreak of cholera, which was to herald the end of these centres for good. Liberia was it was a difficult situation. We were, we were trying to set up tr nutritional treatment centres across two front lines. There were so many factions in Liberia, it was uh, 96. So we arrived to lots of death, lots of destitution. And we started setting up a centre. At the beginning I'd asked, you know, is there cholera? And people said, oh no, there's no cholera. And I'd actually asked the wrong question. I'd asked the sort of closed-ended question. And I'd ask, is there cholera? And they said no, because there wasn't cholera that week. But actually, cholera is endemic there. Had I asked, you know, what do people usually die of? They would have said, oh, cholera. But I hadn't asked the right question. And that one mistake meant that I didn't... Because you, you, you can't do everything at once, so you prioritise different things. So I'd prioritised the feeding, because I'd seen people dying of malnutrition. 
over putting more effort into the water and sanitation. So when people arrived for the treatment, it meant you had a lot of people who didn't know the village. They didn't know where people normally drank, so they started to drink downstream of the village, of course, getting all the polluted water. And so the day it started, we had two cases. Next day, I think we had 10. And then we were treating about 30 cases the next day. And the war started up, and we could actually hear the shooting in the background. We had to leave. And we couldn't get back for two days. And when, when we came back, I think there was 20, 20 dead people. And that made me realize there's so many dangers involved in having centers that you know, I started to try and look for a different way of doing it. Around the same time, Anne O'Mahony, who has worked in emergency situations with concern since the 1980s, was struggling with the shortcomings of feeding centres in Sudan. Our dilemma was that if we set up centres to cater for these malnourished, we would be open to aerial bombardment. We were also worried about ground attacks, and we felt that by setting up a centre, it would be an attraction in itself to insecurity. And I suppose more and more, it became clear that centre-based care wasn't the solution. Up to then, I suppose the, the big constraint to having community care or enabling women to feed their babies in their homes, malnourished children, was the fact that there wasn't a suitable food that could be used in this circumstance. Anything that we were giving out had to be mixed with water. In 1996, a French nutritionist, André Briand, invented a product called Plumpy Nut, a peanut butter-like supplement rich in vitamins and minerals. This was a major breakthrough in the fight to prove the value of the community-based approach. My hope when I was developing this uh, product was to start a revolution in the management of severe uh, acute malnutrition because the solution before that was quite unsatisfactory. So this is what we wanted, to have something which could be used at home. Developing the food was not enough and uh, we, it's like a little bit like inventing a computer without the adapted software. We, we needed some program adapted to that. And uh, Steve Collins is, uh, was very much involved in program management and he was a key person to change the approach. I think the invention of Plumpy Nut uh, was a, a key breakthrough. It's an oil-based product, there's no water in it and so bacteria can't breed in it. And so having this perfect nutritional product that could be used safely at home really facilitated CTC. But in order to develop a more community-based approach, Steve Collins knew he needed to have a thorough understanding of the people, and in particular the women, he wanted to help. If the mistakes of Liberia had taught him anything, it was to ask the right questions. So is the pump broken? How long has the pump that is in the village been broken? One of the key things that struck me when we were developing CTC and looking at life in Ethiopia was the incredible workload that women have. We, we did lots of studies looking at how women spend their days because obviously that's vital. You have to know what women are doing. If, you, if you're going to say you've, you've got to come for a day to a centre, you don't have to know what they're going to miss. ሰዓት <laughs> You wait, Kase Fanta lives with her family in a remote part of Tigray in northern Ethiopia. She's a mother of six and, like other African women, is busy from before dawn until after dusk, working in the fields and looking after her house and family. Hello. 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 Hello.
بدحري اغن افتو غن عمتا لي ملت لهالي كم زعحم سيلا وقعت حزات تانيرا ازي ازي تخوان الي هو بوزيات تلع لواي خون بطميات يخون بصغم يخون كاب علي صريات يخون لي تمالا لي تمالا لا خلا كم زي لالكو اب غدبا اب يحما يصبق لا وعلكو لا هوكو بوسان كتخوان الي هو When one of her children is sick, U8 struggles to get them the care they need. The isolation of her home and the fact that she has no form of transport means that any journey she undertakes is long, arduous and on foot. I realized from very early on that, that, that the main limiting factor wasn't the, the medical care, it was how people could get into the program. And so to do that, you've got to talk to people, you've got to find out how, where do you live? Are there rivers in the way? Or how many children have you got? What happens when you leave your children behind? You know, who's going to take care of them? You know, obviously if it's harvest time, people don't want to have to walk for two days and miss their harvest because someone might steal it or they might, you know, might, birds might come in. So all these questions about what what are their lives like what is their reality well very often when we go to visit the villages we do find that Mother X's child died last week. You ask her why she hasn't, uh, she hasn't brought in her child and she, she would say there was nobody to look after the children. Um, and we got that story after story and, and, and that's quite common. And taking a mother out of their home scene leaves a huge gap. So who's going to feed the other kids? Who's going to provide the care and nutrition and nourishment that the rest of the family needs in the absence of the mother? And very often it doesn't happen. It's, it's again, it's a question for mothers of, of making these decisions that are so difficult that no mother should be asked to make, actually. <laughs> With a better understanding of the difficulties confronting these women, it became obvious to Steve why so many mothers did not make it to feeding centres. Plumpy Nut made it possible to develop a programme which would allow malnourished children to be treated in their own communities. By using a simple band to measure the width of a child's upper arm, Steve argued that anyone could tell if a child was malnourished. The child could then be admitted into a CTC programme to receive ready-to-use food and drugs. Instead of having to leave their family and livelihood for up to six weeks to stay in a traditional feeding centre, mothers could return home and make weekly visits to the health centre for monitoring and therapeutic food. Children who had lost their appetite completely could still be admitted to hospital for care until they too could be sent home with the necessary supplements. This system made it possible to reach and support far more women and children but many people had put a lot of time, energy and investment into the traditional feeding centre model and were far from convinced by this new approach. When children are sick, and especially large numbers of children who are sick with malnutrition, there's a tendency to keep them all together, to, to give them food, to give them medicine, to bring them back under our care so that they can then be released back into home. 
And the idea of CTC was sending these children home with the correct food uh, and the care that went with it so, so that the mothers could actually take care of them themselves. This was, this was a, a mind-blowing idea in some ways. Many of the more clinically-minded professionals had ethical problems with the radical nature of what Steve was proposing. People like Professor Michael Golden, a world-renowned nutritionist who lives in the northwest coast of Ireland. To me, there is an ethical problem about taking risks. If you know there's a risk, you do it step by step and you do it extremely carefully and you do it with a few children that, that you know and then you, you, you build on that. You don't suddenly tear down everything and go out and, and create a whole structure involving thousands of children which may or may not work. I, I don't think that we have the right to take risk with other people. We can take risk with ourselves. But I mean, why should we take to ourselves the responsibility of taking a risk with someone else's life? Despite Steve Collins' conviction that his new community-based approach to treating malnutrition, CTC, could save hundreds of thousands of lives, he needed proof. He happened to be working in the Walaita region of Ethiopia in 2000, when in the middle of yet another desperate famine, he saw an opportunity to try CTC out. The government had banned the setting up of traditional feeding centers as they believed them to be ineffective. Concern were working in a neighboring district and when Steve suggested that they try CTC and study the results, they agreed. In a way, when the CTC idea came along, it came along at the right time because a, a, a sufficient number of people were asking questions about the effectiveness of the traditional model of, of dealing with malnutrition. So then the challenge was that over a period of time, could you actually demonstrate with evidence that this was indeed a better way of dealing with it? And that's what we set out to do. And so we, we worked together to, to design a C2C programme in, in the, the district where Concern were working. And in this one we put in some extra monitoring so that we could actually start to produce concrete data. That, that programme ran I think for eight or nine months and was a success. The mortality rates were I think 4.5% whereas the, the standard you aim for in emergency is 10% and the norm in a, in a developing country hospital is 20 to 30 percent mortality rate. That's 20 to 30 percent of every child that's admitted dies. Whereas our mortality rates were only 4 percent. So it was obvious it was working. And the numbers were quite high. She's feeding them three times a day. And what will she feed them at lunchtime? Will people here still be eating teff? Is there still enough to eat? After 2000, after the two trials we had in Ethiopia, and I realized that CTC would work and that it would be the future. And I, I, I became a bit obsessed by it, I think. So I actually went around to all the agencies I could think of. I went obviously back to MSF, I went to Oxfam, I went to Save the Children, um, Action Control of Fam, all these different agents saying, this is the future, you know, this is what we should be developing. Unfortunately, I, I think it was too threatening at that stage. It was too much of a change. And probably, to be fair, at that stage, there probably wasn't enough evidence. But one person who did agree with Steve that there had to be a better way was Concerns Director of Policy and Evaluation, Howard Dalzell. I suppose when Steve first put it to us, I don't think he realised the full potential of it. And I don't think he realised what would be involved in actually getting it accepted internationally. 
and he wanted to do quite a small trial. And I actually said to him, Steve, I think you're missing the point. I think you're being too conservative. If you really want to make it work, we've got to have loads of evidence in loads of different places and therefore we need to do big trials, not small trials. Tens of thousands and 150,000 quid a year. He was the first person who really realised the potential for this, this, this change. He realised it needed to be a, a coherent research programme. In the month before I'd gone to DFID, the UK government donor, with a project proposal for 100,000, and they had refused. And it was Howard that saw that actually, you need a programme, you need a research programme. What Howard understood was that in order to make real progress, they would need more than just nutritionists in the research team. They would need food economists, sociologists, anthropologists, and social workers who could mobilize a community. But Howard believed in Steve's ideas and agreed to support him in his search for the necessary funding. Well, Howard came to me with this idea about CTC uh, and he explained it and the principles underpinning it. He was very convinced that uh, this was a potentially important way to, to deal with, with hunger, particularly severe acute malnutrition. And he then had the idea that in order to, uh, I suppose, get further support, we would try and get support from Irish Aid. And he went and spoke to Irish Aid and said, critically, we're prepared to put some of Concern's money in this, and would you, from Irish Aid point of view, put some of your money in it? And together, we'd, we, we, we would work together. And obviously, crucially, the, the core idea, which was from Steve Collins. So when Howard came to me, he said, look, we have an innovative project here. We think that through CTC, we can change the architecture of emergency response. My eyes lit up, of course. In the early part of the century, thousands and thousands of people were coming together because of the results of conflict or the results of um, natural disasters. And the UN system and NGOs had put in place a system that was very well run logistically, providing food, shelter, as said, water and sanitation to thousands and thousands. Yet there were great dangers in that. People were coming long distances, particularly women and children, they could have lost their lives on those journeys. And there was the possibility of uh, cross infection of communicable diseases, the issues of HIV and AIDS and sexual exploitation where large amounts of food uh, were being distributed in, in situations of great famine. So we wanted to challenge that. We wanted to determine could we address those issues closer to people's homes, closer to their communities. But this essentially was a, re a, really, a real challenge to the accepted, the, the accepted wisdom. We took that risk. In 1999, Steve Collins had set up Valid International to research and evaluate the effectiveness of aid programmes. With the success of the trials in Ethiopia and with funds from the Irish government and Concern, Valid assembled a team of research specialists who, together with Concern, were finally able to take CTC to Malawi in southern Africa. We started implementing in Malawi there we had another key person got involved, who's Teresa Banda, who is the Ministry of Health Nutritionist. She has worked in malnutrition for many, many years, and she'd seen the problems with centres. And she was willing to stake her reputation and take a chance on giving us a district where we could do a pilot. We were in the process of reviewing national guidelines when Dr. Steve Collins came in. We had a meeting with him in the office, and he brought in some evidence from Ethiopia. So that really got us interested. At that time, we were looking for innovative ways to improve uh, nutritional status, innovative ways to deal with the influx of malnutrition due to the food crisis. We decided as a ministry that we should use one district to implement this and learn from it. With a go-ahead from the Malawian government, Concern and Valid had for the first time a real opportunity to gather hard evidence. They were assigned the Dawa district in Malawi, 
where they treated almost 2,000 children within the first year. And has she seen it used before? I don't know now. Now, Winston, she does it. I don't know. She has not seen anybody use it. No, no. Yes. But it was the work of sociologists and anthropologists that uncovered the most significant and far-reaching obstacles to treating malnutrition. One main issue was the cultural issues surrounding malnutrition. With, for example, people believe that malnutrition is caused by parental sexual behavior. If a, a father goes out, sleeps with some, another woman, and then that brings a spell on the child. The baby's been ill for, for two months. And then the, the, when the child had the problem with the stomach before, she took the child to a traditional healer who burnt the child. What did the traditional doctor say to her? What did the traditional doctor tell her to do about this illness? He says that abdominal parasite. Abdominal parasite. I think that the fact that uh, she's waited for a month. Usually, mothers, even if there's a treatment at the health centre, they wouldn't bring the child immediately. They would wait. First of all, they would try to consult a traditional healer. Until they have failed, that's when they'll, refer, they'll, they'll come back to the program. So later on, we, we try to engage with these traditional healers. Say if a mother sees a child maybe in the, in the nearby vicinity whose, whose child is malnourished, they would encourage them. And that, that's one of the secrets with CTC. There is mother-to-mother -mother transmission of information about treatment, where to go to get it and all, all those things, and how, they, they, how best they can take care of the children. Kudirivangena <laughs> In the two years following the program in Malawi, the team developed a database of over 23,000 cases. They had run 21 programs in four different countries. Their mortality rates remained under 5%, but more importantly, they reached over 70% of those in need, a massive improvement on the old system which never reached more than 10%. They were ready to present their findings to the international community and push for change in international policy. We felt we had enough evidence, enough strong evidence to go public. And we obviously needed to convince the rest of the international nutrition community that these re results were solid. So we organized a conference in, I think, October 2003 to present the results and to have a discussion with the rest of the nutrition community. The Dublin conference was really the turning point, I think. So we really wanted to get the data on CTC to the agencies in a, in a more formal manner and give them a chance to respond and feedback. That turned out to be quite a tension-laden conference. I would have to say it generated more heat than light. There were people who'd worked for two or three decades on refining and improving therapeutic feeding centres. And then there was the, the new fringe doing the community therapeutic care approach. Treating starving children is a very emotive subject. And here were we saying that actually we can do so much better and there's an implied criticism of what was going on before. I think that there was a resistance by some NGOs for everyone to jump into bed and do the same thing and abandon what they were doing. Um, they wanted to see how the risk that was being taken would pan out. 
before they before they did the same thing. Uh, so there was a reticence for everyone to copy and say, we're going to abandon everything we've done in the past and we're all going to do exactly the same as, as Concern. A lot of opposition from large agencies based around volunteers and I think they probably felt a little bit threatened that we were saying that the volunteer model as well didn't really fit with CTC where you actually only need one professional and it's much better if they're a local person who knows the environment rather than a lot of enthusiastic volunteers. There were people still on both sides of the argument at that stage, but what was beginning to emerge was that the evidence was beginning to accumulate. And uh, with that, of course, the argument began to tilt towards the, the, the CTC. After the Dublin meeting, where they'd seen the strength of our data, I think people realised they could no longer use just ideological objections. And I think they realised, in a way, that the CTC train was, was leaving the station and they were either on board or they, or they, they were left at the station. Well, after that conference, we continued to do trials and we also extended the work to other agencies. So it wasn't just Concern doing it, MSF were doing it, um, Tear Fund were doing it, Save the Children were doing it. So other agencies following that conference decided that they were going to give it a real try and see could it work for them, and it did. It isn't just children, however, who benefit from CTC. It has also transformed the lives of thousands of people with HIV AIDS. In 2005, Ortiz Prime Time visited Malawi and met Akeem, who was then close to death. He had been abandoned by his family and had even been moved to a hut close to the graveyard. <laughs> Less than three years later, Akeem has a new life, thanks to the potent combination of community-based therapeutic care and antiretroviral drugs. But the real success of CTC could only be measured when and if the United Nations and the World Health Organization endorsed it. This was the next crucial and defining step. In 2005, a meeting was held at the WHO headquarters in Geneva, which would decide whether or not to replace the traditional feeding centre model. Although some trenchant resistance remained, the majority of those present supported the more community-based approach. But there was still one main stumbling block the way child malnutrition is measured. The evidence has always been extremely strong that middle upper arm circumference is a great predictor of mortality in young children. But there, there was a large group of people who thought, no, no, we need to do mathematics, we need weight and height, basically because that's what we've always done, I think. A factor that, that you could consider is the perfect being the enemy of the good. So if we consider weight for height and you get Z scores, standard deviation, everything, you've got the perfect. That is the perfect gold standard. 
But on the other hand, you have a simple upper arm circumference that, yes, it's not perfect, but it is a good measure to use for a community screening. And when we're looking at public health and when we're looking at options for the community, then we will choose the good over the perfect. In 2006, only six years after the initial trials were carried out by Concern and Valid in Malawi, CTC received the ultimate endorsement from the United Nations. This achievement was the culmination of years of work by the staff of Concern and Valid and of many other agencies, such as Médecins Sans Frontières, Save the Children and the Tear Fund. The pressure was now on African governments to adopt the new approach. Malawi was the first to take up the challenge. But Concern and Valid realised that local manufacture of ready-to-use food was critical. To achieve this, Concern supported the setting up of Valid Nutrition, a new kind of charity based on ethical business practices. With no shareholders, all profits are reinvested into local production and economies. We want to be able to produce a whole range of ready-to-use food, both for treating severe starvation, but also for treating moderate starvation and preventing malnutrition from this factory, made locally in Malawi by local Malawi people, using ingredients grown by local Malawian farmers. Effectively, you've got a, a local system to address malnutrition rather than having to depend on external interventions. The advice I can say to everybody who is interested in this is institutionalize the CTC program, have the highest political commitment, and make sure that the private sector is also given room to take part in the production of the product. We have 201 facilities running the CTC program. Our target is to cover the whole country. And we believe if we can do that, we'll reduce the problem to zero. And that's our target. We want zero malnutrition in Malawi. Community-based therapeutic care, the radical new approach pioneered by Dr. Steve Collins and championed by Concern Worldwide, has transformed the treatment of severe acute malnutrition throughout the world. Although this required conviction, courage and dedication and has saved hundreds of thousands of lives, it is only part of the picture. Severely acute, malnourished people make up only 10% of the world's hungry. The other 90%, the chronically malnourished, are far less visible. These are the hidden hungry, people who may not be in immediate danger of dying, but who are nonetheless suffering from the effects of malnutrition. Apart from the daily torment of going without food and all that entails, these people are also burdened with the life sentence of stunting, the effects of which only become apparent later in life. When a child is born, one of the parts of it which grows fastest is its nervous tissue. And if you don't have the right nutrients in that first couple of years of life when the brain is being wired, then the brain never reaches its full potential. So a child that was born to be an Einstein ends up not being able to cope with primary school. And, and once you miss that two years and you miss that brain development, it's gone forever. You, you can't get it back by good nutrition. In the Western countries, we're now used to opening a jar or putting a whisker in the, the food and actually having energy-rich complementary feeds. So the first feeds that the child is get very energy rich. Whereas the first feeds that the baby gets in many African countries is diluted porridge. There are 40 important essential nutrients, at least 40 essential nutrients. You need every one of them, all 40 of them to be healthy. 
All you do is miss one of those 40 out and you will not be able to resist disease, you will become sick, you lose your appetite. You just, you just sit there like a zombie. One of the worst things about malnutrition is that the child doesn't cry. How do you know if your child is hungry? He cries. How do you know if he's thirsty? He cries. If your child doesn't cry, and you think, oh, I'm a wonderful mummy. You know, I love my child, but my child doesn't need for anything. I can go about my other work. I can go and collect the wood. I can prepare the food. And the child just sits there. So the child doesn't get stimulated by the mother. So you have these two things. You have the stimulation and you have then the nutrients which, which have to make those connections in the brain. But the connections won't be made if it's not stimulated. So you need both. You need good food and you need stimulation. Stunting is something that I don't think is known anything like enough about. And stunting means you're cutting off somebody's life prospects. You're reducing the economic future of many of these countries. And countries themselves need to know that unless they work to prevent stunting, they're actually putting a burden on their own potential for decades to come. Preventing hunger is actually a good investment for individuals and for countries. Now what to be done? Where should the policy focus be? very definitely on better nutrition for pregnant women and children under two. Massive intervention programs to deal with that problem. CTC provided a window into the world of the severely malnourished and in doing so revealed the shocking reality of the daily lives of many African women. Most importantly, it highlighted how their unequal status is contributing to their own and their family's vulnerability to hunger. Not only are they fully responsible for the care of their children and home, they also do 80% of the agricultural work. They have few rights and even less choice. They are usually the last to eat at mealtimes and the first to go without food when it is scarce. They are often anemic during pregnancy and when breastfeeding and their babies are frequently born underweight, perpetuating the vicious cycle of malnutrition. Most mothers, they work very hard in the fields and they grow enough food. Probably in the end, that food may be sold and the children may not be fed enough. They suffer inwardly. They wish they could have done better for their children but probably they don't have the means or they don't have the knowledge to do it. At times it's the feeding practices, at times it's the cultural practices, but um, the inwardly the mother would want a healthy child, every mother would want a healthy child. There's no doubt about it, uh, African women are very much second-class citizens. That's the fact. And while at the UN we pay lip service to equality and gender equality and gender empowerment, it's not happening on the ground. And there is that gap, and it's been increasingly recognised uh, at every level of society. But if we want to improve the lives of women, if we want to improve the lives of children, if Africa wants to produce enough food to sustain itself, there has to be a refocus on agriculture and rural livelihoods. Most of the hungry people are actually living on small farms. So one key way to get around it is not that the state comes and brings food to them, it's that they are enabled to produce the food themselves. And that requires big changes in the importance of agricultural policy, in government giving more support to farmers and to the rural areas so that farmers can can produce and can trade. 
The development of CTC has been unusual in that a private sector research organisation, Valid International, an NGO concern, and a public sector body such as the Irish government work together to make it happen. And none of us could have done it by ourselves, but the public-private partnership worked. Oh look, Kerry Gold, there we go. Good Irish milk. 20, 20 grams. grams. And how much for, for the Kerry Gold? 40 quatcher. Wow. In the world today, there are 300 million children with chronic malnutrition. We know that that can be prevented with just 40 grams of a high quality food complement each day for given over a period of 18 months. So it's, it, this is a problem that is treatable. How much Quattro. is a small one again? Cowbell? Cowbell. 20, 20, 20 gram, cowbell 20 gram. And we're convinced that the sorts of principles of food science that are in our ready to use foods can be used to make not just therapeutic foods, but supplementaries, complementaries that can go into the marketplace that parents can buy for their children. It'll keep them growing, keep them healthy, prevent malnutrition. You know the sachets? Yes, yeah. I've seen it. If it was just half size, mm -hmm. would they would they want to, would they buy them if they were in the shops? They could buy it 50 quatsha. Yeah. That's that's under the cost of production. So that's under that's about two dollars fifty a kilo. I think to date large companies haven't really targeted the, the so-called bottom of the pyramid, the, the, the poorest of the poor, because I think they, they felt that these people just haven't got enough money to buy the kind of products they want to sell. But when you get to a really simple, low-cost nutritional supplement, the market is so big, 300 million people, if they each spend $10 a year only on a quality nutritional product, that's a market of $3 billion a year. Now, that's a substantial market. If multinationals start to create proper, properly designed nutritional products and they price them at affordable level, you're going to have a whole generation growing up who are capable of, of using their brains better and capable of helping themselves more. So as a foundation for development, the changes that are now happening are profound and, and can have real implications in the alleviation of poverty. surprises companies when they hear that an NGO and a not-for-profit humanitarian company are actually following business principles. They don't expect us to be wanting to manage costs very clearly, to be wanting to show a surplus which then gets reinvested. They see charity and business as very different. And this whole concept of a not-for-profit company, Valid Nutrition, with a humanitarian mission following best business practices. It's just unusual. We are clearly moving into a more difficult economic situation where people have many legitimate fears about their future, about their future livelihoods. But at least so far, people in this part of the world were not at least fearful of going hungry. And long may that continue. But that is not the reality for a sixth of the world's population. And, you know, I think those of us who, who have escaped that fear of going hungry do need to think about that sixth of the world's population who still have that fear and that daily reality. The Irish Government Task Force report, published in the autumn of 2008, stated clearly that there had been a collective failure at international and national levels to prioritise ending global hunger. Community-based therapeutic care demonstrated that when there is a genuine desire for change, solutions can and will be found. And yet, every night, one in six go to bed hungry. This idea that we're doing it because we're compassionate. That's not, it, people have a right to health, they have a right to good nutrition, they have a right to education, they have a right to security. It's not 
doing good to ensure those rights are, are maintained and, and upheld. It's, it's their rights. So it's, it's a work. You, know, you have to do it. I don't want people to do it because they're such nice people. I want people to do it because they can create change and because that's what they should do. Child death through serious malnutrition is probably the greatest blasphemy in the world today. It simply shouldn't be allowed to happen. It's morally unacceptable. And I think what will actually stop it happening is moral indignation. Slavery was seriously tackled 180 years ago. It wasn't tackled because women in America had dishwashers and hoovers and fridges and microwaves so that they didn't need slaves in their kitchen. It was blown out the water because people said, this is wrong. Our fellow human beings shouldn't be treated like this. It was a moral victory, not a technical victory. We have the technical answers to malnutrition, but to get rid of that blasphemy requires conviction and, and advocacy and, and acceptance of everybody's right to food. It's as simple as that.